Good evening and welcome to JFSA's Brain Health and Wellness Initiative Series. Here at JFSA, we bring community education each month to inform and promote a broad landscape for brain health. We offer CEUs to our professional audience as well. Today's topic is infectious disease and dementia. What we don't know, we don't know. Presented by Dr. Dennis Grossman. My name is Jonathan Yasani, and along with my colleague, Hannah Dolls, we provide care navigation in the JFSA Dementia Care Navigation Program. Our program establishes an empowering environment to help improve the quality of life of those who have dementia or at risk of developing dementia, while helping family caregivers reduce the stress and burden that often occurs while caregiving. At JFSA, we understand the importance in working with our clients' strengths and applying a person-centered approach to care, which extends throughout our multidisciplinary team of geriatricians, nurses, social workers, and geriatric psychiatrists. Hannah and I meet our clients where they are at and develop individualized care plans that help produce solutions to presenting problems. From linking persons with dementia and their families with community resources, to following them with their medical management. We are their point of contact for guidance, as well as a listening ear, which we take into account when creating interventions that adhere to their biopsychosocial needs and experiences. While presenting, please feel free to address any questions, thoughts, or comments to the Q&A icon. We will take some time after the presentation to answer your questions. Our presenter, Dr. Dennis Grossman, a graduate of Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine with over 30 years experience in internal medicine, has been on the staff of University Hospitals Bedford and the Hoosier Medical Centers, Cleveland Clinic South Point and Marymount Hospitals, Metro Health Medical Center, current medical director at JFSA and a clinical instructor at the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Dr. Grossman has served as a Chairman of Medicine and Chief of Staff at UH Bedford Medical Center. He has had affiliations with several nursing homes where he followed his patients after their, after their discharge from hospital stays. He offers continuity of care and values the personal relationships with patients by following them over time with continuous monitoring to ensure positive health outcomes. For the past 30 years, Dr. Grossman has been interested in the effects of diet on chronic Western diseases and promoted plant-based diets and macrobiotic diets. Dr. Grossman believes that they play a key component in preventing and reversing some types of diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, stroke, and degenerative joint disease. I welcome you, Dr. Grossman. Thank you, Jonathan. It's always a pleasure to be here. Um, the topic, uh, infectious disease and uh, dementia. Is there a correlation? You know, what we don't know, we don't know. It's kind of controversial. We do know a lot about dementia and heredity, about dementia and lifestyle. But I wanted to examine uh, the role of infection and again, uh, some of this uh, may be a little more controversial, but uh, some of the evidence is somewhat uh, compelling to think in terms of other contributing factors to dementia. So we do know that acute infections are known to cause changes in the mental status, and especially in elderly, when we see a deterioration, we start looking for reasons Usually there's a urinary tract infection, maybe a smoldering pneumonia, uh, an infection, a cellulitis, and possibly a blood infection, which would cause an acute change. Of course, once it's identified and treated, the cognition returns to normal. But my question is, what about occult chronic uh, microbial infections? Can they be responsible for cognitive decline over years? Show me how to just arrow. Okay, there we go. We're mostly microbes. A hundred trillion viruses, fungi, protozoa, bacteria in, inhabit our surfaces, every nook and cranny. 
Our cells are outnumbered by 10 to one. Every surface has a microbiome, which is a, really an environment. The skin, the genitals, the eyes, the respiratory tree, the nasal pharynx, and the gut. And if we broke it down, you could see that um, uh, the primary or organisms of these surfaces are, are very specific. In the skin, it's usually staph. That's why we, we fear the staph infections that football players get uh, when they break their skin. Um, gut infections, uh, E. coli, uh, uh, vagin vaginal uh, lactobacillus. And also we know that half of our stool is made up of microbes that we get rid of and it, they just keep multiplying. A lot of this material comes from a book called Infectious Madness by Harriet Washington. And I wanted to just give her her, her props. Embedded in the walls of your gut microbiome, micro, microbial rainforest, in her words, is a web that has a thousand times more neurons than your brain. So this web is called the enteric nervous system or ENS. It weighs twice what your brain weighs and it deploys neurotransmitters that communicate directly with your brain. This enteric nervous system also shapes your immune system and it has 80% of your immune cells located there. It guides your reaction to bacteria to invasive species there's 3.3 million genomes in the microbes we harbor in our gut compared to only 25,000 human genomes. And just to take a, a, an example, the vagal nerve, which uh, runs between the central nervous system and the uh, enteric nervous system, it's called the 10th nerve, uh, also called the 10th cranial nerve, the wandering nerve, which is what the word vega means, communicates primarily from the gut to the brain. 90% of its messages actually go up from the gut into the brain and tell us what's happening there. What's interesting is that uh, they've shown that Helicobacter H. pylori, which is implemented in gastric ulcer disease, which uh, they discovered about 20 years ago and changed some of the treatments for uh, ulcers, meaning that uh, they could treat it with a myriad of antibiotics uh, and acid blockers. It also contributes to the cognitive impairment in Alzheimer's disease. May Boudouin's research found that H. pylori cells travel from the gut to the brain, up the vagus nerve, where the bacteria cells aggregate and these characteristic amyloid proteins that everybody talks about in Alzheimer's disease uh, may actually trigger, uh, I'm sorry, these amyloid proteins will trigger a plaque buildup. And this plaque buildup is, uh, is what impairs the mentation. And statistically, under the age of 40, 20% of people have had H. pylori. Over the age of 60, 50% of people have had H. pylori. So there's a lot of a lot of H. pylori that could contribute to uh, amyloid buildup. How does the uh, how does the bacteria or the microbes get in to the brain or into the system? Well, any port of entry you like: skin and eyes, mucous membranes, genitals, respiratory tree, gastrointestinal tract, stomach, small intestines, mouth, gums. What's interesting is that um, our body has protection. So uh, what do we do to protect ourselves? Well, in the mouth, we have our own, what we call protective biofilm. And it's made up of friendly bacteria. They're mainly uh, gram positive ba bacteria that create a covering so that uh, other bacteria, bad actors don't get into the uh, bloodstream. They don't get into the system. It also requires alkalinity in the mouth and uh, alkalinity in the mouth depends on adequate saliva, which is alkaline and also uh, mastication, which is chewing food well, breaking it down and allowing the, allowing the saliva to mix with it. Um, and the, 
this little graph talking about um, alkalinity, acid, and neutrality, the pH scale. I'll, I'll explain that a little bit later. But again, the, uh, the body has uh, a, a system where it uses um, acid and base, al acidity and alkalinity to prevent um, bacteria from getting into the uh, bloodstream. So in the stomach, now from an alkaline environment, in the stomach is hydrochloric acid, very low pH. And the high acid content kills unwanted bacteria. It also, it allows protein to be digested easily because protein is uh, amino acids. In order to digest an acid, you need a stronger acid. What's the strongest acid would be uh, hydrochloric acid one of the strongest acids around. Also, when you break down uh, foods correctly in an acid environment, you are able to absorb, oop, that's a typo, absorption of minerals and vitamins into the system. In the small intestines, we switch back to alkalinity. Um, sodium bicarbonate gets uh, secreted, but also bile secretions and pancreatic enzymes are all alkaline. And this helps to form a protective biofilm, just like in the mouth. Again, it's primarily gram positive. And then when I refer to gram positive, gram positive just means that somebody named the, a stain, a gram stain, and when it took it up and became purple, it was called gram positive. And if the bacteria didn't take it up and it didn't turn purple, it was gram negative. And uh, that's just the way we categorize things for the last 50 or 60 years. Also, what's important is biodiversity. Um, in the small intestines, the more types of bacteria you have, the better your protection from anything that would go wrong. So what happens to this protective biofilm? Well, it, in the uh, I'm sorry, in the, uh, the protective biofilm in the mouth actually will break down in an acid environment. And these are foods not necessarily acidic, but foods that when they start to be digested will cause an acid environment. Usually these are um, sweets, sugary uh, substances, but also if you have a lack of saliva, in other words, you can't secrete enough uh, alkaline material, if you have poor dentition, meaning your, your teeth are hurting you or you don't have teeth or you've lost some teeth, all of these cause gingivitis, periodontal disease, tooth decay, tooth loss, and more importantly, they uh, contribute to you being overrun by gram-negative bacteria, the bad actors in, in the mouth the ones that cause gingivitis, the ones that cause periodont periodontitis. The biofilm forms, the, these, uh, these biofilms can also uh, form plaque when gram-negative bacteria are in the mouth. And that's a bad biofilm. And plaque, of course, is what the dentist is trying to get off of your teeth that's built up and what you're trying to get off every time you brush your teeth or you floss. And um, I actually uh, was listening to a tape that said that uh, um, should you floss before you brush or should you floss after you brush? Um, I think the consensus was you should floss before you brush, but that was what I, what I took away from it. But anyway, um, uh, so the gram negative bacteria are what will break down uh, the uh, biofilm that was protective and create their own biofilm, which allows entry into the bloodstream or directly into the nerve root. So, rat, did I skip something? Whoops, did I go back? Uh, here, okay. So, what are their evidence? What evidence is there that there are infectious agents in the brain of demented people? Well, there's a microbial theory of the origins of sporadic Alzheimer's disease. And this theory um, actually uh, states that there are 
many different uh, types of bacteria that have been found in the brain. And the feeling is that these are the instigators of what causes the breakdown, the accumulation of uh, amyloid and the fibrinous tangles, the tau tangles, things like that. And some of the bacteria, herpes simplex, cytomegalovirus, uh, H. pylori, type, types of treponema, which is uh, a uh, uh, syphilis organism. Did I do that wrong? So again, rather than the causative agent, these amyloid plaques and these neurofibrinous tangles may actually be our own immune system's defense against microbes. In other words, what we're seeing may not be the problem. It may just be our poor attempt at trying to solve the problem. Well, what causes us to be more susceptible to the invasion of these microbes? Aging. Unfortunately, we all age, uh, can't do much about that. It affects our immune defenses. It affects um, our uh, ability to make good uh, biofilms. And so as we age, we are more likely to have a, a breakdown of these defenses. Inflammation, so anything that causes inflammation and infections cause inflammation, but actually uh, even trauma goes hand in hand with breaking down uh, barriers. And lastly, uh, the bacteria themselves can secrete endo and exotoxins, things that will actually break through the barriers and cause uh, bacteria to enter into the, uh, uh, to the organism through various channels. There are four pathways to the brain. Um, one is uh, the blood-brain barrier, and that's just the interface between um, uh, the blood circulation and their cerebral spinal fluid and brain itself. The second is the uh, vascular flow to the brain, and that's where we get our nutrients and our oxygen. Those are the blood vessels that come up through your neck and go into your brain. There's also direct travel through cranial nerves and through the vagal nerve which is a cranial nerve. And then there's also uh, what we call neuroendocrine transport through hormones, through neurotransmitters from the gut. Microbes have an affinity for the nervous system and they easily cross the blood brain barrier once they're through the, uh, the gut barrier. Some believe that the nervous system, because it's so essential to our well being, so well guarded that the microbes have figured out it's the safest place for them to hide and thrive over prolonged periods. Well, think about it herpes zoster, chickenpox. Well, you got that in childhood. It took several decades before it reemerges in a nerve root as varicella zoster, shingles. Same bacteria just hanging out for a long time in your nervous system. Treponina, tre, treponema pallidum, syphilis. These infections take decades to become tertiary syphilis. And uh, most notably the infamous Tuskegee experiments by the federal government that ran from 1932 to 1972, 40 years of withholding treatment of, of uh, 400 African-American men who were infected with syphilis, who uh, later developed 10 times the rate of tertiary syphilis as did those that were not infected. One of our black marks in terms of our, our medical profession. Number two, vascular flow. Damage to the vascular system, which limits nutrients and oxygen flow and decreases the ability to have normal mentation. So what's interesting about this is that um, there's a test called the calcium scoring uh, test, which uh, is a computer, a quick computerized scan of your heart. And we use this when we try and uh, find people that are at higher risk for coronary artery disease and heart attacks. And so you uh, put in the scanner and we actually count up how many calcium particles there are in your 
uh, in your blood vessels in the heart. You're given a number. So less than, uh, less than 100, that's really good. 100 to 400, well, that's average. Over 400, that's really high. That means it's your rate of heart disease. It's much higher than the person who has a very low number. Well, recently, these calcium spots have been shown to be the results of prior microbial infections and the body's immune defenses against the attack. So think about it. There's bacteria that got into those um, blood vessels in your heart and also in your neck and the carotid arteries and smaller blood vessels. And the body is just doing its job and the aftermath, the aftermath is that a little bit of calcium speck is left behind as a reminder that there was a, uh, a bacterial infection there. And as I said before, in the carotid arteries, plaque formation has been shown to be the body's response to microbial infections that, that line the blood vessels. So infectious agents may play a bigger role in vascular disease and its contribution to dementia. direct travel through the cranial nerves. Well, this is fascinating to me. We, we know somewhat about this in terms of the vagal nerve where um, H. pylori seems to work its way into our system. But there's also been evidence that the trigeminal nerve, which is the fifth nerve, innervates the face, innervates, it has three branches and it goes first branch, second branch, third branch, and uh, what's interesting is that they've shown that, especially in the second branch, in the uh, maxillary, in the maxilla, which is the bone above where your upper teeth are, that the nerve roots there can get infected. Um, and most commonly it's with P. gingivalis, which is an infectious agent that people get with in periodontal disease. And that is a direct spread up the nerve root into the brain. As I mentioned before, the vagal nerve was implicated as a conduit for microbes. And what's interesting is that it is also implicated in Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia. This was uh, brought, to, uh, brought to light by a Swedish study in Sweden, which is uh, socialized medicines, which of course we don't have here, but one of the great things about uh, their records are that they have immaculate records that go back many years. And they looked at uh, 50 years of records of people who had been treated with the gastri with gas um, for gastric ulcers with a procedure which cut the vagal nerve, the 10th nerve. There are two types of operations that they used to do. Don't do them anymore. We have other treatments. The first was called a selective vagotomy, which cuts the branches of the vagal nerve by the stomach. And so then you don't secrete any more acid and you don't have ulcers and that solved the problem. The second was called the truncal vagotomy. So the vagal nerve, when it uh, comes up through the, from the stomach, it comes up into the neck and they would cut the, uh, the nerves in the neck thereby uh, cutting all of the, um, uh, all of the, the uh, transmission to the brain from this this vagal nerve. So those that had the truncal vagotomy were significantly uh, less likely to develop Parkinsonism. In fact, the rate was about one third and therefore uh, Lewy body dementia than those that had the selective procedure. Somehow the severing of the nerve stopped the transit of something along its path from the gut to the brain, which they surmised was some sort of microbial or viral uh, culprit. Studies have shown also that um, in, in terms of neuroendocrine transport, that gut micro, <coughs> microbiome can influence hormonal and neurotransmitter levels circulating throughout the body. The, bo uh, the gut is, is rich with serotonin, with neurotransmitters, um, with uh, all sorts of things that influence the brain and uh, the nervous system. And treatment of metabolic abnormalities uh, produced by pathogenic microbes in atherosclerosis or Alzheimer's disease 
including elevated homocysteines, lower nitric oxide, can be accomplished by a protocol that changes the gut mi microbiome, increase, increasing fiber and increasing vitamin B intake, which in effect stops the, uh, these metabolic abnormalities from producing their effect on the brain and therefore lessening the likelihood of dementia. So just to go back and uh, maybe reiterate a little bit, um, bacterial causes of dementia. Well, we know that syphilis has been a cause of dementia for centuries. Um, slow to manifest itself, taking decades, but its, it's source is usually the, uh, the chancre eruption in the genital area, which is basically a, a, skin, a skin area that breaks open and allows the bacterial spirochete to get into the bloodstream. As late as 1980, syphilis was still one of the most significant causes of dementia. Hard to believe. Crutzfeldt Jakob disease, also known as mad cow disease, was spread by an ingestion of disease animal or through accidental contact of some body fluid or body part. Um, people that got uh, corneal transplants from somebody who had uh, Crocsfeld Jakob disease would get it. Took many years to manifest itself, universally fatal. There's no cure. Lyme disease, transmitted through a tick bite through the skin, spread via the, the uh, bloodstream to the brain, causes a cognitive impairment in some people. HIV dementia, before we had treatments, <clears throat> was was uh, commonplace, developed, um, and it would it would not take that long. It was again HIV in the early years uh, was not treatable, and so it was a rapid demise. But many times, uh, these uh, these people would have dementia, would have a breakdown of their cognitive function uh, well before they died. COVID-19, hate to bring it up to date, but 80% of the sequela, we call them the long haulers uh, syndrome, 80% of these are, are neurologic sequela, brain fog, we call it. We still don't know what's going on. And, uh, you know, we have uh, people complaining of uh, balance problems, of uh, thought disorders, you know, forgetfulness, things like that. So, um, we don't really know what the toll of that virus is. Um, some prominent examples of uh, infectious agents in Alzheimer's disease. We know that herpes simplex, <clears throat> chlamydia, chlamydophilia, pneumoniae, oral spirochetes, H. pylori, uh, P. gingivitalis, and I don't even know how to pronounce this last one, acnes. <laughs> These are all contributing agents that have been found in the brains of Alzheimer's patients. As I mentioned before, uh, just to reiterate a little bit about biofilm. So the protection of biofilm, bacteria are, um, they're, they're very social and uh, they like to get together. And when they get together, they like to, I guess, make a nice, um, living space. And uh, the, so they create a living space of biofilm and it, uh, it allows them to feel safe, to communicate with each other and to replicate well and to keep the bad guys out. So um, these are three dimensional layer, you know, so they're thick, they're uh, covering the whole surface. Dental plaques are biofilms that are not so good. But again, um, it's a community of bacteria that are trying to protect itself. Um, they also can be protective in the gut. They prevent unwanted bacteria from invading. As I said, the destructive mic <clears throat> microbes such as spirochetes create biofilm, which contribute to the amyloid beta deposits in Alzheimer's patients. What's interesting about this is that in the brain, they found that um, the, uh, the spirochetes create their own uh, biofilm in the brain. And so um, this is just like in the mouth or in the gut. And this is what 
contributes to the uh, the um, amyloid beta amyloid deposits. And one final thing is dysbiosis. So dysbiosis is pathogenic bacteria that take over and outnumber the healthy bacteria and viruses, which leads to breakdown of natural protections, healthy biofilms and infiltration ultimately of the bloodstream by uh, pathologic microbes. Uh, the opposite of dysbiosis is biodiversity, which is a healthy gut, meaning multiple organisms, most of them being gram positives. The wider the diversity, the better. When the gut has diminished types of microbes, it's more susceptible to disease. Reduced diversity leads to increased permeability of the gut through the breakdown, breakdown of the biofilm and the penetration of pathogens. Dementia is linked to loss of biodiversity through diet and exposures to toxins and other things. High fat diets, especially saturated fats, low fat diets lead to less, I'm sorry, low fiber diets lead to less diversity. Factors contributing to dysbiosis through a lack of diversity of microbes. Diet, as we've, we've stated, Antibiotic usage, so uh, antibiotics tend to wipe out many bacteria and uh, lessen the biodiversity and also allow a situation where sometimes gram-negative bacteria predominate. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications tend to also uh, decrease biodiversity. And then certain microorganisms themselves will uh, create a situation where when they start to proliferate, they crowd out other uh, bacteria and lessen the biodiversity. All of this leads to a reduction in what we call brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, which reduces neuroplasticity and results in dementia progression. So dementia is multifactorial. It, it's multifactorial and infection may play a bigger part than we realize. Obviously it's not the whole picture, but we're starting to see more and more, uh, more and more studies looking at this. New therapies may be aimed at this component. Oral hygiene is important. I just, uh, you know, for whatever reason, I think, uh, we probably have, uh, have discounted our dentists and uh, our oral hygienists, but they probably play a bigger role in terms of our health. Healthy gut microbi microbiome is essential. And that has to do with diet, healthy diet with emphasis on increasing fiber to over 30 grams a day and lowering saturated fats and processed foods important. And then vitamin supplementation may help may be helpful in many cases. And now, any questions, comments? Like I say, this is a little bit out there. Um, and, um, you know, we don't have all the information, but it's just another piece in the puzzle of, uh, of our, our complex question, what causes dementia and where do we put our, our resources to minimize its effect on, on our population? So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grossman. That was a wealth of information that I am still taking in, but it was amazing. And I've learned a lot, a lot that I have, um, that I'm really happy to learn because I haven't, you know, Heard much about that before and it's but it, there's a reason I think because sometimes when we go through some of these um, continuing education courses they're all they all kind of sound the same and so this is actually looking at it through another lens and it makes sense um, that everything is interconnected in our lives so I really appreciate the knowledge that I learned tonight so we will take some time for some questions and answers the first question we have um, here is what specific vitamins are helpful? So, 
Um, the specific vitamins they were looking at was B1, B6, and B12. Um, and we've known that the B vitamins are uh, certainly are helpful in terms of the nervous system and the nerves. So to, um, to kind of punt at it, I would say a B complex with all the Bs. And if you have any concerns, you can get these uh, checked, B12 levels checked, especially if you're on medication like metformin. Um, if you're on medication that suppresses your stomach acid, so if you're on omeprazole, Prilosec, Protonix, Nexium, um, these may interfere with B12 absorption, and that's something that you may want to look at. Our next question, can you please comment on the long-term use of PPLs in the brain health? So proton pump inhibitors, um, and that's, that's a tough topic. Um, so proton pump inhibitors do, uh, do two things. Number one, interferes with uh, absorption of, of uh, certain vitamins and minerals. But number two, it changes the acid content. And remember, um, acid kills, uh, there's strong acid in your stomach and they're there for a reason. They're there to digest food, primarily proteins, but they're also there to kill bad bacteria and uh, viruses. So, um, I'm not sure. My comment is we don't know, but if you can uh, minimize the use of proton pump inhibitors, it's probably best that you, you minimize them. Yes, PPIs. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so um, I actually thought of an interesting, um, just a thought that I've always had about people always say you have that gut feeling. And when you were mentioning about the communication between the gut and the brain, it just kind of hit me in a spot where it made a lot of sense to me because everyone always says, if you have that gut feeling, go with it. And your gut is your second brain. I've heard that a lot too. So I just thought that was really interesting. Um, and I thought that was really actually kind of cool to learn that there is that much communication between both. So it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, are there any tests that can um, help one know like if they're going to have future problems with their biofilm or different areas or like genetic tests out there that can um, let someone know if they may be more susceptible to some issues? Well, that's, that's a good question. Um, well, first off, in terms of the biofilm in your mouth, your dentist is probably the best test is getting an opinion. If you're doing a good job, if you're, if you're addressing the hygiene in your mouth, in terms of your gut, which is this, basically the small intestine, um, that's an area that we don't know yet how to um, figure out what's, how to determine if there's going to be problems. Um, we're looking at it. There are some pe people say that there are tests that can be done, but it's not in the mainstream. Gastroenterologists um, are just starting to uh, figure out uh, what is good in terms of your gut microbiome. And we've known that um, actually if you replace the gut bacteria with a healthier gut bacteria that people tend to, to lose symptoms such as um, diarrhea, um, uh, people that had, um, I'm blanking on the infectious diarrhea, well infectious diarrhea, they've been cured with uh, with actually being donated normal gut uh, bacteria. Uh, Clostridia difficile is, is the most prominent thing that comes to mind. Uh, 
in people that resist all the uh, antibiotics that are treating that, they end up getting a uh, transplant, a, uh, a colonic transplant, not, not a colonic transplant, but a colonic bacterial transplant from a donor. And most of them do extremely well and it cures them. So, But there isn't any test right now that I know of. What about probiotic supplements? So what about probiotics? Um, so probiotics probably aren't gonna do you a lot of good. Um, maybe if you've had some antibiotics recently, it's not a bad idea to try and replenish your gut with uh, better bacteria, but what they found is that the amount of um, bacteria in the probiotics is minuscule as to what you really need. And a better way of uh, dealing with it is what we call prebiotics. So prebiotics is actually um, fiber rich foods and they are the building blocks that allow the bacteria to multiply, the good bacteria to multiply. So. I would focus on prebiotics, on the right types of food and probiotics. I mean, it certainly wouldn't hurt you, but I think it's kind of uh, not enough to make a huge difference if you've got uh, a significant problem there. The next question we have is a question about exercise. How much of a role does exercise play? Um, in terms of dementia or, <laughs> or in terms of your gut, but I would say in terms of dementia, it plays a big role. It improves the circulation. It probably Im improves your neuroendocrine system. It improves your vagal nerve tone. Remember the vagal nerve is, um, is the nerve that goes from the gut to the brain and they've shown that exercise actually stimulates the vagal nerve in a way that it, um, uh, it improves transmission of uh, neuro, the, the neuroendocrine uh, uh, transmitters. So I think exercise does a remarkable job. I'm not sure how it affects the actual um, uh, gut microbiome, things like that, but it does indirectly affected by vagal tone, by circulation, by oxygenation. All those things are important for feeding the brain and creating a situation where you have optimal mentation. Okay, I'm just going to check and see if we have any more questions. I don't see any. If you, if you guys think of questions later on um, or when you guys get the PDF copy and you see anything that is of interest or a question develops, please feel free to reach out to me or my colleague Hannah. I will have our contact information um, in the next couple of slides here. And we will be more than happy to reach out to Dr. Grossman and get those answers, questions answered for you. Okay. Oh, I think we might, oh, someone commented, good work. Oh. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to go to the next slide here. Here we go. So I did want to reiterate, I wanted to let everyone know that there will be a link available to retrieve the presentation in PDF form. We highly recommend and encourage <laughs> all to complete our survey, which you will receive through the email that you registered for this class. If you are wanting CEUs, it is mandatory to complete the survey. And again, here's our contact information for any questions. 
or comments. Here we have our two geriatricians that work with us in our care dimension navigation program. And they are Elizabeth O'Toole and Constance Magulius. Um, they both have years of experience they bring to our program and our, our clients just love them. They take the time to listen and answer questions and work with their um, caregiver. So they also help um, create care plans with the care navigators to be sure that all aspects of their life are being um, checked and taken care of. We also have Leanne Stuver. Many of you may be aware of who she is. She is our Savvy Caregiver Workshops Facilitator, as well as our Dementia Support Group Facilitator. And she also has brought many great webinars here for the Brain Health and Wellness Series. And here's Nicole Herbert-Hale. She's a case manager and also works in our Dementia Care Navigation Program. I just wanted to go over a few additional resources that we have with our Care Path Dementia Program. So as I mentioned, we have the Savvy Caregiver Workshops and that is for family caregivers only. It's a six, um, six week program where you can learn how to learn better approaches on different behaviors associated with dementia, ways to know how to reevaluate situations and it's evidence-based. It's a really a great program. We have our dementia support group. So that's open to the community. You can come and go as you please. Right now it's over Zoom. And within our dementia, support, um, dementia navigation program, we offer um, respite and support home care as well. And of course our brain health and wellness series for community education. If you um, would like more information, you can go ahead and contact Nicole Herbert Hale at 216-903-1189, and she would be happy to help you with registration. Our upcoming live webinar, the topic's going to be Remembering Names, a Challenge for Your Memory, and that's going to be presented by Leanne Stuver, Thursday, August 26, between 6.30 and 7.30. And that's all we have for you guys tonight. So I hope you enjoyed and we will see you next month. And I hope you all have a great evening.